barbecue ginger. Let's go! We'll do it live. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Good evening and welcome to the Really Big Barbecue Central Show. This is the show that talks about all things that are important to the world of barbecue and grilling. The show, of course, originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city, Bomb City, USA, Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I'm your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday evening's live fire fun and frivolity show. If you want to jump in on the show this evening or you don't know how to follow the show, here's all that information. You can get in touch with the show by sending an email to greg at the bbqcentralshow.com. Follow us on all the social media channels at BBQ Central Show. And be sure to subscribe to the show podcast feed on your favorite podcast platform. Anything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, the BBQ Central Show.com. And here's what's happening in case you can get the newsletter which I think you can find on the new website. I'm not sure about that. I'd have to go back and check it out. But I think what I ended up doing was eh, maybe it is still there in the head. Go over to the new website. If you haven't seen it yet, let me pull it up here for you so you can take a look at the great work that these crack staffs that no names please. Here you go. This is it. Bang. So is there? Yeah, right there. You can go right here where it says show newsletter and you can put in your name and email address. Uh, And then you can also scroll down and see all the latest shows. And we're still evidently working on the sponsors portion. And then right there, you can also subscribe to the podcast top and bottom of the new website. So, hey, a lot cleaner and a lot more modern. However, I'm not going to mention who did it because I still feel like I'm being held captive to a certain degree. And I can't get any customer service from these people. Get that big stuff out of here. Uh, and, and to answer Jason King's email or uh, uh, question, which looks a little something like this, you paid for that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's better than anything that I'm going to do, of course. But remember, you get what you pay for. So if that's lackluster to you, don't worry. I didn't break the bank on this. But you also have to remember what the old one looked like. So what you see now, while it might be laughable, Jason, a light year ahead of what it was for the last 10, 11, 12 years or whatever. So, look, we take what we can get. I'm not a webmaster. I don't really even need a website. I just would like somewhere for somebody to go if they run across it on the World Wide Webs and subscribe to the podcast. I just need somewhere to keep the feed. That's the only thing that I even care about is the feed. I lose the feed and we are fucked. Get that big stuff out of here. Or I'd have to retreat and only do the show on YouTube or something like that. I don't want to do that because they hate me and I hate them. However, the feed is where it's at. So the feed lives in the new website. The feed lived in the old website. The feed will live somehow in the new website that I'm currently in the process of getting built to usurp the new website that I just had built. And here we go. What can I tell you? Anyway, here's what's coming up on the show this evening. But first, let me tell you that you can wait. Did I, did I just blow over the top of the open altogether because Jason sidetracked me? Guy stays away for months on end, then he comes back in, and all of a sudden I'm off track. I'm sorry. Coming up in about 10 minutes from now, 
you know, a couple months ago, Meathead, I think it was January, brought up just as a side conversation about Koji, and that really sparked the interest of many of the listeners, many of the people that follow me on social media, wanting to know more and more about Koji, how to use it. Meathead said he's got a portion of his new book dedicated to Koji and the use of it. Well, it just so happens that the city behind me also happens to house the Koji Authority in the world. And joining me, also co-owner of Larder Delicatessen on West 29th Street, Jeremy Umansky, will join me not one, but two segments. So let's say the balance of the first hour, where we will talk about Koji from a high level, and then we will start to dig into actually how to use it and things you can do with it. And then we'll keep it live fire integrated. We'll talk about using Koji on the four big barbecue meats, that being chicken, ribs, pork shoulder, and brisket. We'll also talk about using Koji on steak. And then as time would allow, we'll talk about getting outside the box. What else could you use Koji on? So if you were wanting more information on this whole Koji fascination, then this is the two segments that you'll want to keep locked and loaded because Jeremy is going to spread a incredible and incredible amount of knowledge and insight on Koji. He has co-written a book about a year and a half ago called Koji Alchemy, which was up for James Beard Award nomination for Best Book of the Year. So he knows all about it. He is the leading expert on Koji. He is continually consulted, does talks, the whole deal. And Jeremy has the first hour. Then we'll move to the second hour. It is the third Tuesday of the month, and that brings new 2023 monthly guest, Wes Wright from cookoutnews.com. Lots of news continuing to break here over the last month, so we'll talk to Wes about all the cool stuff that's happening, new stuff that's being released into the market, new patents, new copyrights, and all the good stuff. And then closing out the show, because it is the end of the first quarter... Texas Monthly's barbecue editor, Daniel Vaughn, will be joining us. We'll be talking in depth about Truth Barbecue because a couple weeks ago I was in Houston and I didn't realize as I was waiting in line to Truth Barbecue that that was number three on the top 50 list on the most recent top 50 list from Texas Barbecue. So we'll talk to Daniel about Texas Barbecue now that I've had my first real bites of a top three, top 50 list. So only two better, according to Texas Monthly. Very excited to talk to him about that. And then we have some other things to talk about, not the least of which is getting a history lesson on how come most barbecue places, especially those that are central Texas themed, spread across throughout the land, even here in Cleveland, Ohio, are giving you garnishes of onion, pickle, and white bread. Why is that? Where did it come from? When did it start? And why is everybody doing it now? So Daniel will give us the look back on that as well. And some other topics to squeeze in there as time allows. So that's how your show is shaking out here this evening. Don't forget, you can follow me socially, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat. And we say good evening to everybody watching through Facebook and Twitch slash BBQ Central Show. Also watching on YouTube slash RD Rempe and audibly on Clubhouse as well. YouTube Poll of the Week. And you can weigh in right here. Which fuel do you prefer to cook with? Gas, charcoal, or wood? And currently, 55% of you are saying charcoal. Coming in a close second at 45% wood. And 0% of you are saying gas. Zero. Not a one? Come on. There's got to be some gasser out there that just loves the convenience of gas. And you are forsaking all other of the cooking fuels. So we will continually update that as I try to remember. We'll be asking the guests as well. And here you go. So let's start here tonight. I want to say this. The numbers are in after a week out of Kent Rollins' last appearance. He showed up in the first interview. Was that the first interview segment? Oh, dear. Kent was at 1014 last week, and the numbers are in. Kent Rollins, top three most downloaded slash watched event in show history. That's going back a number of years. We've had a lot of great guests. We've had a lot of big download numbers. But Kent is now number three 
And that single appearance, although it was his second appearance in total, but his last appearance easily outranking the first one. A lot of people jumped in on the live and even more people jumped in on the download because it's more easy to watch at your convenience, which I certainly understand. So Kent is now in the top three most downloaded shows and most watched shows as it happened live in the show's history, which we all know I am now in the 15th year of doing live shows. And at the top of the second hour, we'll talk about a little bit more of the show history, which you might not be aware of, that's coming down the pike sooner than later. And then, of course, we have some quick feedback from past shows, Daryl in Oregon. Writing in, Greg, longtime podcast listener, love the show. I have really grown to love your segments with Sam the Cooking Guy. You two are really having at it this last time around. I enjoy the difference of opinion that is apparent between you, and I love that neither of you hold back. Thanks for a great show all these years. Regards, Daryl. Daryl, thank you for writing it. Before we get to Jeremy Umansky, I will talk to you about Pits and Spits, some of the best-looking, best-cooking smokers and grills on the market today. Pits and Spits offering a full family of products, including traditional offset smokers, wood pellet grills, charcoal grills, travel grills, combination pits, fire pits, and much more. Pits and Spits has been one of the only American fabrication shops that's focused on smokers and grills for almost 40 years. Why is that important? They're able to put an emphasis on quality and design, locally sourced materials, and unmatched attention to detail. From the fully welded barrels to the heavy gauge steel, they bring both function and beauty to life. Pits and Spits builds every product with the intention it's going to get passed down for generations to come. So it doesn't matter if you're in the competition scene or if you're just looking to take the backyard grilling game to the next level. There's a product for you and their portfolio. Check out this custom website pitsandspits.com slash bbq central all spelled out that's pitsandspits.com slash bbq central and use promo code bbq central for a free spice pack with your order of five hundred dollars or more so if you're ordering a new grill you're easily crossing that five hundred dollar threshold you're going to get the free spice pack as long as you use promo code bbq central at checkout pitsandspits.com slash bbq central that's pitsandspits.com slash BBQ Central. We are back to talk Koji with the Koji Master from right here in Bomb City, USA, Cleveland, Ohio. Jeremy Umansky, stick around. I'll be right back. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Casting live from the Barbecue Central Show Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. Welcome back to this portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers. Visit CookinPellets, C-O-O-K-N, CookinPellets.com for more information or to purchase you can also visit Amazon.com to purchase as well. However, they recommend go to the website first and then further look down the line. That's great folks over at CookingPellets.com. My guest in the first hour this evening, a man of many talents and expertise. What expertise, you ask? How about one of the leading mushroom forgers in all the land? How about a four-time James Beard Award nominee? How about... A co-owner of one of the best deli slash restaurants in all of Bomb City, USA. And if that's not enough, the leading Koji expert here in the United States and someone who I am honored to call both a friend and someone who inspired me to go out of my comfort zone when it comes to trying things to eat, which happened as recently as this past Thursday when he gave me a sample of lamb heart and testicle spread. <laughs> Who's going to get me to do that? I'm going to tell you who right now. It's Jeremy Umansky. Hey, Jeremy. How are you, pal? Hey, Greg. How you doing? You did it. You got me to eat heart and testicle all off the same spoon. And while my insides were like doing a cringe, I said, you know what? 
this guy has never steered me wrong when it's come to food. You've got me to eat the most bizarre things that I would probably never think about to eating. But I think it's the way you bring it across and your intentional use of literally everything that's coming off an animal. Is that something you learned growing up is to make sure you're using everything? Uh, you know, I wouldn't say it was so much a focus of, uh, you know, my parents cooking or my family's cooking growing up. Um, but my grandmother was a kosher caterer here. She was born in 1920. She definitely came up during the depression. Um, so those sensibilities were highly ingrained in her and my parents and, uh, definitely grew up in the type of culture where you got to clean your plate. Because if you don't do that, you're not getting all your nutrients. You're also disrespecting whoever cooked for you. So it was more that focus compared to uh, making sure nothing's wasted. You know, that came much, much later. Jeremy Umansky joining us here on the show. So we have a lot of Koji talk to get here during our time together this evening. And I appreciate you giving me some extended time here in the first hour. But if you don't mind, since Greg, it was... anything for you. Oh, well, I certainly appreciate that. So... Uh, it was October of 2018. That was the last time you were on the show. So shame on me for having that much time escape to having you back here in the confines. However, can you give us a quick high-level background on you and how the passion for food grabbed you originally? Yeah, you know, I was really fortunate. As I said, my grandmother was a kosher caterer. So from a very young age... Uh, food and feeding people, uh, serving people. That was just how my family showed love. That's how we took care of each other. It's how some of my family members made money. Um, so right from an early age, that was kind of the exemplar of like, well, this is this is how you take care of yourself and others. Uh, and really fell into that. I mean, uh, to, to that point, I'm the oldest of four siblings and three of us all work in food service. Um, and although I have a lot of cousins that are no longer in food service, at one point or another, a lot of them did also work in there. So uh, it's kind of filtered in, you know, down throughout the family. But uh, over time, you know, I went on, I, I decided I was going to be a chef. I went to culinary school and I fell down this crazy rabbit hole in culinary school. I was farming. I, I met a farmer. I was running their farm, a 40 acre vegetable farm. We were raising animals and vegetables. I met a fermentation guru who showed me how to make everything from sauerkraut to charcuterie. I apprenticed underneath a French chef from Lyon at that point and learned a lot more about charcuterie and uh, kind of the, the cooked things. So more in the barbecue realm, right? Let's cure a pig's leg and then slowly smoke it for a few days. Um, so, you know, picked up those things and eventually found my way back to Cleveland, uh, after kind of zigzagging around and I had built up this skill set where I was a chef who could forage and ferment and farm and really, really decided that I was going to be the type of culinarian that made things that the chefs would cook with. Hmm. And that's how I kind of ended up to where I am now. I maintain that Cleveland is the best food scene going between Chicago and New York City. Agree or disagree? Oh, agree hands down. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, as far as kind of like a mid-tier, middle market city goes, so you know, a few things you have to look at. Cleveland is the poorest big city in the nation. And to pull off the culinary scene that we have being the poorest big city in the nation shows off a lot of ingenuity, a lot of gusto, a lot of this isn't the rust belt, right? We're polishing up that rust. We're making it shiny again. We're embracing new green technologies. We're embracing the Great Lakes as this awesome resource for activities, for food inspiration, all sorts of things. So um, it's really fantastic that we have it. And and. I'm just blown away, you know, and it's not just Cleveland, Greg. I mean, you've traveled a bit around the country. You talk with chefs all over the place. Like, you can find a world-class meal in Norman, Oklahoma. You can find one in the middle of the desert somewhere in New Mexico, in Arkansas, in places you would thought you'd never be able to find world-class food. You know, this kind of boomerang effect, this thing I did. You know, I went away from Cleveland, spent a lot of time in New York and other places and came back. People all over the country are doing that with their hometowns. And you just find amazing food anywhere. And Cleveland is, is I don't want to say as good as it gets, because I think it can get even better than it already is. So, Present company excluded, 
Who's the best chef from Cleveland? You know, there's so many chefs doing so many different things. And as chefs, we kind of specialize in various areas. So there's certain food that I just don't connect with. I don't mm -hmm. understand. I maybe don't necessarily enjoy eating. Those aren't foods that I would want to cook and serve to someone because I couldn't put that type of connective emotion into serving you those particular dishes, you know? So I, I don't think we necessarily look at like who's the best chef, but who's doing what they're doing the best of their ability and it's just awesome. I love places like Cordelia on East 4th Street that just opened. Absolutely incredible. Um, lovers of smoke and salt will definitely, definitely enjoy that menu there. Um, they're absolutely fantastic. But you have great chefs too, like uh, Liu Fang, who is a chef from Shandong in China, who's been doing pop-ups at Larder and just announced uh, we'll have her own spot on the east side uh, for full service starting in two weeks. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think anybody's cooking contemporary Chinese food uh, anywhere between Chicago and New York as good as she's doing. You know, on the flip side, she's not a burger cook. So I love Bon Rossavong is going to be up in Collinwood and he's going to be opening Doink's Burgers really soon. Like he's one of the best burger cooks in the city. So I, I think everybody in Cleveland, all these chefs have found their niche and they're doing such amazing jobs of what they're really passionate about and lovely about. And that's why you can find so much good sh food in so many different places. And it's not necessarily about the one chef or these few chefs. It's about how all these chefs are synergizing together. People are hanging out, they're eating each other's food, they're promoting each other. And that's how you really know you've got a synergistic, holistic food scene that's organic and people really love and enjoy because it's truly delicious. Jeremy Mansky joining us here on the show, one of the co-owners at Larder Delicatessen, the website larderdb.com. So I did a segment with Meathead beginning of the year. I think it was the January segment because he comes on once a month. And he's in the process of writing a new book. He was originally trying to pitch it as like a two-book set, but I believe at last conversation with Meathead, the editor said, look, it's just going to be one book. and Let's focus on that. So that's what he's doing. This new book includes a portion about Koji. We talked about it briefly, but I got a huge amount of reaction from the Centralites yearning for more, wanting more insight and uh, more education on this. And I'm like, man, who's a better person to get than the guy I know to be the Koji master, the guy who co-wrote a book called Koji Alchemy, which was up for book of the year from James Beard uh, award. So when did Koji first get on your radar, Jeremy, and what drew your curiosity? Well, I got to put this out there because I owe Meathead an email. So I'm <laughs> glad we're bringing him up right now because I totally got to get back to him. Um, you know, Koji is infinitely fascinating. All right. So um, just to kind of catch anybody up who's listening that maybe hasn't heard about this. So this is a mold just like the mold that maybe grows in your shower or your leftovers you forgot about. But this mold specifically is good for us and does really cool things to our food. And the things that it does is it takes the core building blocks that make up all our food, our proteins, our sugars, our fats, and it can break them apart into the individual things that make them up. And in the case of something like proteins, let's say you got a nice big hunk of meat you want to throw on the grill. Well, the koji will do its magic via enzymes, these specialized types of proteins it itself produces. It's, it's actually its digestive juices. And it rubs it all over the meat. And as this thing does its dance and does its party all over there, it breaks the proteins up into the umami amino acids that it's made of. So we can literally synthesize MSG and these associated umami flavors out of a steak without actually adding MSG to it. Wow. That's pretty crazy, right? Like you can literally make a steak, any cut of protein you want to examine, the best tasting version of itself, because literally on a microscopic level, you're unlocking taste and flavor molecules that would normally not be present till after your stomach acid started to break something down. Hmm. 
And we can create that in a controlled way ahead of time that's actually delicious for us and has over time a lot of nutritional benefits. We've been using this mold to make things like sake and miso and soy sauce for the better part of 10,000 years. So we know what we're doing with it at this point, no matter what culture who's using it, everybody's got different names for it and how they apply it. But in recent years, we've really kind of doubled down on taking it out of maybe some of its more traditional settings that are found throughout Asia and kind of porting them into, well, how do I cook my pastrami in Cleveland, Ohio? Mm. You know, Koji has a home in there and it can allow me to make a pastrami, A, incredibly fast because of this enzymatic action and incredibly tasty with almost no more work than I would normally be doing. Um, it's incredibly beneficial and it, and it just doesn't stop there. You know, we're not just talking about umami, umami flavors. We're creating very, very interesting arrays of simple sugars from uh, starch breakdown. And there's starches and sugars in your steak also. You know, individual muscle cells are made up with all these little constituent parts and Koji's enzyme, everything's so small, it can actually work as individual muscle cells and, and create flavor. So you get free sugars. And then through the breakdown of fats, uh, Koji creates esters and fatty acids. And when you smell something delicious that's cooking, that breakdown also happens. So Koji can keep that on the meat and keep it ingrained in the piece of, of food that you're cooking with. So the aromatic molecules are going to be that much more enticing, <laughs> that much more um, inducing of, uh, you know, salvation and that sort of thing. Like you smell that steak and your mouth is dripping and you're like, oh, I can't wait for those juices to drip down my chin, you know, like your mouth has already started the process. So Koji can actually do this to like the 10th degree for anything. And it's seemingly magical how it does it because we just take koji itself, like grown on rice or barley or a liquid expression of it, or we take miso or sake or soy sauce and we add it to something. And already we notice like this incredible benefit to our foods. So using it all the time is, is just, uh, I hear from some people like, oh, this is too good to be true. Or, you know, the flip side of that is you use it in everything. And it's not too good to be true. <laughs> We've proven that over 10,000 years. And yes, you can put it on everything and it'll make nearly anything better. Is there only, is Koji one thing or are there multiple strains or versions of Koji? I kind of liken Koji and we kind of got to keep in mind, this is the Japanese name for this mold, specifically when it's grown on rice or barley. Okay. They have other names for it when it's grown on beans and other substrates. And the substrate is what the mold actually is growing on. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, we kind of push it out, we break it apart, and we see that no matter like what the koji touches or what, what its intent is, how its enzymatic action works, it's always beneficial for the creation of flavor the changing of texture and and literally like making a food just that much better and it and, it, and it's a simple plug and pl play greg i mean literally like uh have you ever used soy sauce in a marinade before you put something on the grill absolutely and it, it noticeably if you put that same cut of meat on the grill without that marinade like there's a big flavor difference now the cool thing about koji is when we when we take it and we've had it um that's kind of grown on rice or barley or whatever we make this liquid extract of it um you know we don't necessarily have to process the koji further into something else like a miso or a soy sauce and right away, instead of the koji's enzymes acting on like a bean or something else first, it's right away hitting the meat first. Mm -hmm. So there's ways that we can work with it that are really simple and ways to source it that are really simple too. You know, you don't have to get into the romance of growing this and thinking you're going to brew the most perfect sake ever invented and that sort of thing and pair it with your great steak. Like, sure, you could, you could have that as a goal and you could obtain that. But um, there's so many things about it that can be intimidating for some people, right? It comes from Asia. It's using a different style of food. Hey, I don't use miso in barbecue. Does it even belong in barbecue? Does sake belong in barbecue? You know, any of those questions. And the answer to all that is yes. And Koji also has a place and it's very easy to use and it's very easy to pull it, plug into. So how does somebody start the Koji journey? They're listening here this evening. They're going to get out on podcasts. They're buying into everything that you're saying and now they want to try. So how do I start from scratch? Because we've hit on it, you've hit on it a couple different times about growing it on beans or rice.
but like I'm dumb, so I don't even know what that means. It sounds like there's a step that has to happen before that, before it actually starts growing. So how do we begin the journey now that we all buy in? So, you know, to, to really begin the journey, you actually have to source the spores. Um, and these are like the seed of a plant. They're super, super tiny. They sell in like packets that are measured by the gram. Mm. Okay. And a 40 gram packet of spores, uh, we're talking a little bit over an ounce. An ounce is like 28, almost 29 grams. So 40 ounces of spores is enough to grow 400 pounds of this mold on rice or barley. Wow. That in effect is like, that's a lot of Koji. How long is that going to last um, you? Like forever. Yeah. I mean, listen, I use it a massive amount of my restaurant. Like we make rye bread with it. We make pastrami with it. It's, it's in everything. The fried chicken say, you name it. There's, there's Koji touched into it. And I would say like just the molded rice or barley that's freshly grown. We go through maybe 20 pounds of that a week. And we use a lot. So when you get this little 40 gram packet, you know, it costs you 20, 30 bucks, depending on shipping, that sort of thing. You can literally grow like all the koji you ever need. Yeah. For any use you'd have at home or for a lot of restaurants in that case. So, it, so it kind of starts there. But, you know, that, that can be a huge barrier to entry for people, especially you're like, listen, I just want to get some of this stuff rubbed on my meat before I get on the grill. There's so many outlets. And I think the, the two, Outside of the obvious, like rubbing your meat with miso or having soy sauce in your marinade, which which are direct ways you can use koji and get the benefits of its umami flavor and all these other things that it does. Uh, you know, the other way is to look online and source something called shio koji, S H I O. It translates to as salted koji. It's going to be like a liquid, kind of looking like a porridge, like a mushy oatmeal. And it is salt and the koji grown rice mixed together. And it's just this tasty, amazing, salty marinade. Uh, whether you want to saute some broccoli with it or, you know, put it on something before you put it on the grill or cure something all the way through with it and then smoke it. Like there's so many options. And the other one is one that doesn't have salt in it. Very similar. It's a liquid. Uh, it's called Amazake. And that's A-M-A-Z-A-K-E. So the Amazaki is going to be kind of similar to the Shio, but it's typically not as fermented. It's a little sweeter, much sweeter, and it doesn't have the salt in it. Um, and that's my go-to at our restaurant. And you can find little Tetra Packs of these like on Amazon, in Asian grocers. Uh, the Chinese have their own version. The Koreans do. and they So you can find them on their different names in various markets. But they all kind of look like rice porridges. And a lot of them will be either in a Tetra Pack or a glass bottle. And from there, you source this, and then it's just about like getting it to love on some meat. When you get it from said procurement, does it go bad, or because it's a mold, it's just like good forever? Or? So at this point, the actual mold itself, like you end up killing it. So you grow it for 36 to 48 hours. It produces all these crazy enzymes that do all this delicious food, you know, flavor things and tenderization to the meat. And then after that, the mold itself is dead. Mm. It can start to grow again because it's gone through its life cycle and its, its spores, its seeds are there and it more can grow eventually. But the mold's done and, and you've, you've essentially your job when you work with Koji is to kind of act as a farmer. And the product you want is the digestive juices of the mold. I know this sounds super weird, but when we talk about like um, microbes that help us out in food, everybody's got to understand that these microbes are like eating bits of our food and they're metabolizing those bits and then secreting bits that preserve our food. So they're basically eating our food, pooping the food they just ate back onto our food to preserve it so it's safe for us and it tastes good. Makes sense. So, you know, you you get into these realms of like, what's actually happening? Are we actually using the mold when we use Koji? But no, we're actually, we're growing it so we can extract its, its digestive juices because that's what creates flavor for us and really good aromas and helps with all these other things like tenderization and texture and whatnot. So, um, you know, at this point, you've wanted to obtain these enzymes. That's the digestive juices. So getting these pre-made you know, products where you haven't had to grow the mold and then turn it into the Shio Koji because mm -hmm. there's steps in that or turn it into the Amazaki. You can get it ready to go and ready made. You can also find uh, inoculated grains, so either rice or barley, that have the mold that's been grown onto it already. And then those are low temperature dried. 
So the enzymes are preserved. And that stuff too, you could get that and powder it up and use it in part of your cure and still get enzymatic benefit that way too. Mm -hmm. So there's many ways you can do this, but the goal is to get these enzymes and get them onto your food somehow. So we're going to stop there for a second. I'm going to tell everybody about Primo Grills. And then when we come back, we're going to recircle into the live fire community. We're going to talk about using Koji on the four big meats, ribs, chicken, pork shoulder, and brisket, best ways, and then what we can expect when we do this. Is that all right with you? Yeah, that sounds good. We can even talk about some no-sugar barbecue sauces that actually taste sweet. All right. so Some fun stuff we can talk about, Greg. Stand by, and we'll be right back with Jeremy Umansky from Larder Delicatessen right there on West 29th Street on the west side of Cleveland Hingetown, for those that know. What do we love about ceramic cookers? We love that they are fuel efficient. We love that they can achieve low and slow temperatures for traditional barbecue meats. We also love that they can get rip-roaring hot for the high-temperature grilling of steaks and other thin cuts. But what's missing in the everyday lineup of ceramic cookers? The real ability to do true two-zone cooking. Two-zone cooking is very important to both professional and backyard cooks. It's the best way to manage a fire and cook with confidence. However, Getting a two-zone fire and a round ceramic cooker isn't very realistic. Why? Because it's round. Enter Primo Grill and the game-changing oval design. The shape gives you the ability to execute that two-zone setup that you desire, but it also gives you all the other ceramic grill benefits as well. So when you break it down, there's more than 60 different ways to cook on a Primo cooker, so you're only limited by your culinary imagination. You can find a dealer near you by visiting primogrill.com because they are only sold through dealers. They have all the accessories that you want, including a rotisserie, a pizza insert, and more items to come. By the way, as I had mentioned last week when I was at the HPB Expo a couple weeks ago, I did see firsthand and in person the Primo XXL, the one that's 25% bigger than the old biggest one, the XL. So if you're looking for something that has a little bit more capacity, the XXL is out. And once again, you can find all these ceramic ovals at a dealer near you. Find it at primogrill.com. Here's the bottom line. Best ceramics in the biz, patented technology, true two-zone cooking capabilities in multiple sizes. And if you have to have a round one, they do have those, but we always recommend the ovals. Check them and feel them, and then take one home that's best for you. Get educated by the sales staff at the dealer, and away you go. Follow Primo on Facebook and Instagram. It's primogrill.com. That's primogrill.com. We are back with more Jeremy Umansky right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Howard Stern, Jim Rohn, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. This segment brought to you by Fireboard. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring or connect via Bluetooth. If you have smart speakers in your home, you're in luck because Fireboard fully integrates with all of them. Find out more by visiting fireboard.com or call 816 816- Nine four five two two three two, and don't forget about that fireboard spark i've been using mine like crazy over the last week and a half and it works really well one channel fireboard and an instant read meat thermometer fireboard.com and we're back with jeremy mansky from a larder delicatessen and the co-author of koji alchemy all right so we're going to talk about putting koji on our four big barbecue meats that all the lion fire enthusiasts love so let's start with chicken uh, how do we want to use it, and what can we expect a koji to do to chicken? So one thing I want people to kind of keep in mind is koji can actually help you create some shortcuts to getting some really good smoke. Great. You know? Um, one of the things, too, a lot of people, you know, after they come out of their uh, their wet brine or their cure, whatever they're doing, um, you know, you got to let that meat dry out and get good pellicle formation, right? You want that good tacky, sticky surface and, you know, a good dry out that can take 10 hours. That can be overnight, you know, a piece of fish, a piece of chicken, whatever it is. So, uh, Koji actually, when we use a liquid marinade like this Amazaki, there's so many free, simple sugars in there that we don't have to fully dry out. We can literally go out of the wet cure right into the smoker and all the smoke still sticks on the skin as if a pellicle was there because there's all these free sugars attached from the koji. Mm. So that's really cool. And I really like what that does to a whole smoked chicken. 
literally, I take the Amazaki, I rub the whole chicken in it. I will salt my meat. You know, if I'm eating it hot or cold, it depends. You know, some things you smoke and then you chill and you enjoy them. Other things you serve them hot. So, um, you know, stuff that I'm typically going to be eating hot fresh, I salt to about 1.75%. Um, I lately have been doing a lot of work with silky chickens. You ever see these things, Craig? No, I haven't. You got to go to your county fair. You know, we got to. <laughs> we'll, maybe we'll meet up at the Lake County Fair, the Cuyahoga County Fair, one of them, and, and we'll go see them. The silkies look like they have a pom pom, like a, a, a cotton ball on their head, and they got these <laughs> fluffy, really feathery feathers, and uh, they just look like a walking cotton ball. But they're really cool because they have a, a genetic defect that A, gives them an extra toe on each foot, and B, makes all of their blood, skin, flesh, and organs black. Hmm. So they have a lot of melanin, just like someone you know who from Africa who has a lot of melanin in their skin. These chickens are the same way. So we've been messing around with the, those a lot. And just the, the marinade, you know, we do about 1.75% salt by weight on that animal. Uh, whether you want to spatchcock it or not, whether you want to bone it out or not, you know, it's inconsequential, right? Because we're cooking to a finished temperature on here. And I, you know, I get in the Amazaki and I'll typically, you know, as long as as little as an hour is enough to really get some great flavor development and, and some color enhancement on there. And I'll tell you what, what the Amazaki does to the skin of that chicken as it smokes and renders down. Mm. Um, a lot of the aromatic compounds that Koji can create from fats are just really high note delicious. They like smell like sweet roasted fat and just caramelization mm. and just that waft of just yeasty beefiness. So Koji creates that even out of a chicken. So putting the Amazaki on there, 1.75% salt. I'll typically smoke, you know, I, I've got a green mo uh, mountain um, grill over here great off pellet smoker it does great for me at home you know on that thing i'll go nice and low um you know i'll i'll have that thing running 175 for a bit you know let that go a couple hours and then maybe to crisp up the skin that last finish i'll bump mm -hmm. that grill up or even do it under my broiler in my oven at home and it's just incredible what it does um you know the moisture retention if you're adding koji in you know you're you're brining before and you add some of that enzymatic action in you're going to notice it's way more juicy it's more flavorful it's just the way to go it, it just works so good mm -hmm. my favorite pairing is koji and beef fat but with a whole chicken a whole smoked chicken that's really where you let it shine because what are you talking about you're talking about a chicken a little bit of salt, some seasoning, and smoke, you know? So really, really showcasing that chicken for what it is. And I hope everybody's getting chickens that have that bright yellow sunshine, yellow fat on them, uh -huh. chickens that have been running around in someone's yard eating bugs and stuff and getting all fat on, you know, other animals and living the real chicken dinosaur life that they still live. So, you know, you want to show that in its true light and you want to add some beautiful smoke to that and take care of it for a little bit. Literally just that Amazaki, some salt, that's all you need. All right. What about ribs? And does it matter if we're using St. Louis spares or baby back ribs? Yeah, you know, when it when it comes to ribs, uh, kind of, you know, blanket again, going back to the chicken, just that simplicity, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and ribs, I feel, end up don't necessarily become about the flavor of the meat, comes about how like the spices were balanced and the crust was put on there and like all of those things that the meat got flavored with, right? We're not eating the meat off of a rib because it's the most flavorful cut on an animal. Like that's, that's just not the case. We're adding so much to ribs to make them extra flavorful. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I have an Eastern European Jewish deli and we serve just plain smoked ribs sometimes. And people are like, Oh, these are ribs. This is just like plain smoked meat and there isn't much on this bone. So, um, you know, I feel ribs, it's all about what you bring to them, you know, and, and how you treat them as you're cooking. It's not actually about like the inherent flavor of the meat. So Koji does a lot of things. And, and I think a really great way to really hammer in on ribs and kind of bring some of that like Chinese smoker hanging oven kind of flavor to things is just a good miso rub down. Mm. Find your favorite miso. A lot of misos, uh, especially the commercial ones that you're going to get, you know, from the Asian market or even the regular supermarket, they're going to hover around 10% salt. So just do a nice kind of reasonable layer. Maybe take a few tables. I, if I had a whole rack of pork ribs, I would take maybe five tablespoons of miso, thin it out with about five tablespoons of water, 
or maybe I'd use even something sweet, you know, maybe put a little molasses in there or um, you can get sweeteners made from koji. They, they make them, they're all over, rice syrup, all sorts of things. So maybe dilute a little bit of that in there and then rub it on the ribs, mm-hmm. let them sit an hour to overnight and then just get them on the smoker. Uh, the flavor you're going to get is just absolutely incredible. You're going to bring out the inherent umami of the muscle, the meat itself. You're really going to shine that and you're going to pick up on the flavor of the pork ribs, you know, and not just all the smoke and the cure and everything you've added to it. You're actually going to get some really good, unctuous, umami, meaty flavor out of them. So I think miso and pork ribs just go so well together. Pork shoulder is much more fatty than the baby back rib, eh, spare rib obviously the fattier of the ribs, but when we talk about pork shoulder, you able to do a little bit more stuff with that because there is more fat in it? Yeah, you know, potentially you are. Um, But once again, you know, shoulder is something you want to go long, low, and slow with, right? So I think the first thing you have to do is ask yourself how long and low is low and slow? Because Koji's enzymes, these enzymes are types of proteins, right? So uh, proteins, let's think of the well done mark. Let's take 165. These enzymes are like little Pac Man. They're running around doing all those, even though they're not alive, they're moving around doing all sorts of things and making your food really tasty and tender. And um, they're most active synced with certain temperatures. In fact, 140 degrees Fahrenheit is an optimal temperature and 165 is when they stop kind of they they're done their protein is denatured they've unraveled they can't move around and do their thing anymore so if you're cooking low enough you can actually accelerate the work that the koji's doing Hmm. so let's say you hold that pork butt for about four hours at 140 before you kick it up to the next level maybe you're going to hold it there at 180 you know, for a couple hours and then keep going and keep going until you finally hit your internal mark that you're looking for in your butt. Uh, You can actually couple those lower temperatures and compound and actually double, triple, or even quadruple the enzymatic action and the flavor creation of the koji. So something like a pork shoulder, like shio koji is a great bet. Because of there's more fat, shio koji has these higher note aromas to it that are more akin to like honey and flowers and tropical fruit, people say. You pick up a lot of that in the shio koji. Uh, Depending on the amazaki, you can too. But you put that on and that goes so great with the fat of most animals. Mm. So really getting that on there, rubbing it on there, and then monitoring your low and slow, maybe starting in that 140 range so you can actually hyperactivate the enzymes that the koji has brought to the party, create tons of flavor while you're actually cooking. And before you get to the point where the enzymes aren't really doing much anymore and they've just kind of done their part. So, you know, there's a lot of strategy that can be involved with optimizing the Koji and how it can work for you. Obviously the last one is brisket, beef brisket, which I assume Koji is right in the wheelhouse of. Yeah, man. So at Larder... A slow week, we're going through 150 pounds of brisket. Yeah, wow. Keep in mind, we're only open five days a week for like seven hours a day, something like that, you know? Um, So we go through a lot of brisket. We use a lot of koji. And what we primarily use for that is the amazaki. So it's this kind of porridge with all koji's enzymes and everything that doesn't have the salt added to, to it. The reason for that is we're very specific with the salt content of our pastrami, uh, the salt content on there is two and a quarter percent. Uh, we do use cure to 0.25 percent. We flip flop back and forth. Sometimes we do a mix of pink and celery. Sometimes it's all celery. Sometimes it's pink. We just we we go back and forth. Sometimes um, we uh, cure to that percentage. Uh, and while it's on cure, the liquid that's kind of in there in that brine is straight amazaki. Um, you know, we do a couple other things to our pastrami too, because I can go from a raw brisket to on your sandwich in three days if I want to. And you would have sworn I had that under cure for a month and then, you know, slow cooked it for a few days. So, um, when we do this, there's a couple things that we do that we find really important. We mechanically tenderize our brisket. So we butcher it a very specific way. We get whole briskets in, we butcher them a very specific way where we seam out directly point and deckel. Um, once we get to the tail end of the decal and it's still attached to the point, we cut it so that the tail of the decal is stuck on the point. 
turn the point into two pieces, the decal into one, and then we do jacquard everything. Mm. And we end up with a decal that's as thick as a point after we've jacquarded everything. We have even curing times throughout everything, you know, equal penetration from the outside to the center. Um, and like I said, we can do this in 72 hours and have a finished pastrami, wow. you know, something that notoriously is under cure for a month, roughly, you know, whether it's brine or dry. And some people, I know cats is, they smoke their pastrami for like three or four days straight, low and slow. We don't do that. We do a six to eight in our Chinese hanging smoker that we use at the restaurant. Um, you know, and then we do a multi-hour steam the next day after a full day rest after, after the smoke. But what, it, what it does, I mean, it, I can only, I guess, speak to what I've been told, you know, um, and we serve apparently some of the best pastrami in America. So mm -hmm. that's what Koji does to a beef brisket. You know, it turns it into one of the best things you've ever eaten. We, and we also, you know, we go the opposite end too with brisket, Greg. And I think I fed this to you before we make something that looks like prosciutto, but it's made out of beef brisket and we just slice it thin and it's so delicious too. I mean, to eat that and to eat a piece of pastrami next to each other and realize they're the same cut of meat, your mind's just like, what the hell just happened? You, you've given me slices of fat, like on the meat boards at times when you have it, there is a section of beef fat, which is delicious. Yeah. So on the underside of the brisket, you get this kind of, kind of like a kidney shaped or bean shaped kind of hunk of fat that come on the underside of the brisket. And, you know, a lot of people just rip that out or cut that out and just, you know, it's scrap, it's grind. So it's got this great striation from the decal that's kind of attached to it. And literally we, we cure that just, just like, you know, prosciutto or any other fine charcuterie. Like we put that piece of meat that's normally thrown away through, through the charcuterie making process. And then we slice it. And, you know, my old business partner, Kenny, he, he's like, this is, it's like lardo, but it's from beef. It's, it's suet. It's so he started calling it pseudo. Um, and, and that's, that's what we stuck with, with it. But yeah, you know, that's, that's another way we, we do a whole bunch with saving as much of that brisket as we can. And, and you know, the goal is right. Like whether you're a chef or you're at home, you don't want to buy a hunk of meat and trim it up and like have this scrap that you can't do anything with. Right. Or just end up with a boring pot of stock or like something stupid, like bolognese sauce. You know, something you can't cook on the grill. <laughs> I, I no offense to people that love bolognese sauce. I, my daughter is, is named Emilia after Emilia Romagna and Bologna is <laughs> a city there. I love bolognese sauce. So, but, you know, uh, to, to be able to buy something, a hunk of meat, treat it right, you know, honor that animal, you want to eat every last bit on there. So butchering it in ways where you can keep fat in different places that maybe it wasn't there before and that sort of thing. We, 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 we have a lot of fun with it. I want to ask you about this specifically before we wrap it up here this evening, and that's the use of koji on steaks in order to attain dry-aged flavors or something that would be akin to dry-aged. I'm a big dry-aged guy. I've had 100-day dry-aged. I haven't gone crazy, mostly because I haven't found anybody that's really stretched it out any anywhere past 100 I'm gonna days. Have to do, I'm going to have to do something for a year for you. Please. So, yeah, that's right, because you got the dry-ager in the shop anyway, but... Uh, so I'm good. I, I know I'm good at 100 days. Uh, my wheelhouse currently is 60 to 75, but I wasn't offended at the higher days. But the first I had heard about Koji was I can get dry aged flavor in record time and not have to stick primals in a, in a dry aged machine in order to attain this. So somebody wants to try it out, uh, tell us how to do it. And then also the, the time it needs to, Koji needs to be on it for X amount of time in order to give you what would be akin to X amount of time in a dry age. Yeah. So, and once again, there's a, a kind of, we talked about, there's a few different levels to entry, right? Do I want to get the spore from Japan from a maker there and grow it and do all this stuff? Or do I want to have something that it's kind of easier for me to jump right in and work with, you know? So, um, with the, uh, the dry aging flavors, so a lot of the aromas that Koji creates on a microscopic level are also aromas that other molds create during the dry aging process. Mm -hmm. Koji just happens to do this in hours instead of like days, months, and weeks. All right. So when you typically dry age something, you have it in there for a long period of time and all these different molds grow on it and enzymatic activity within the meat itself. It All this works together as this like cacophony and symphony to create these aroma and flavor profiles we associated with dry aged food. 
the great thing is Koji does that on meat naturally with its enzymatic activity mm. much faster, almost instantaneously when we compare. So after like a 48-hour Koji treatment on a steak, you are literally creating on a microscopic level the same flavor compounds that the other molds and bacteria and the, the enzymatic action in the meat took 30 days to achieve on its own, just sitting there. So it's not the exact same. It's a bit different, but when it comes down to it, it's like a 75% flavor match, <laughs> you know, these dry age flavors. So, you know, there's so much complexity to dry aging to like really drep replicate dry aging. You can't, you just got to dry age something, you know, there, there's really no shortcuts. But the good thing is Koji on a microscopic level does the same thing as dry aging on a much faster timeline. So it can create very similar phases very fast. And there's a number of ways you can do this. So the, if you want to go all into it, you can literally, just like we ferment meats, right? Summer sausage, uh, sopressata, right? Even dry cured stuff. Like it doesn't matter what cook. We, we ferment meat. Like this is a cool thing. You, you People listening should be like, oh yeah, we ferment meat. It's cool. I'm not going to kill anybody. <laughs> um, so we can actually take a steak. Add a little bit of starch because the mold does need some starch. It can't just grow on pure protein like a muscle, cut a muscle. So we we mix a little bit of the koji spores with a little bit of like cornstarch or rice uh, uh, flour or even AP flour if you want. And we put this on the steak. And I shit you not, we will then hold that steak at roughly 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 90 degrees humidity for about 48 hours. The same thing you do when you ferment meat. Now, mind you, you're doing that with ground meat when you make a summer sausage, right? Anytime we work with ground meat from a food safety standpoint, that's a nightmare. That's a, oh my God, we're taking everything from the outside, yes. we're grinding it right. in, we're mixing it, we're spreading it everywhere. A whole cut of meat, most things that will make us sick, that sort of thing, are just surface dwelling. They can't get in. That's the beauty of food safety. That's why we can just sear a steak and it still be safe to eat, you right. know? Poultry is a whole nother story, but we won't get into that now. So uh, we can literally hold the steak there, 90 degrees, 90% humidity. The mold will grow beautifully on the outside if you've done this all right. And you've literally, the mold produces its most amount of enzymes when it's actually alive and growing. But everything we do with Koji is happens after the mold is dead and it's no longer growing. So this technique creates some of the most interesting flavors and and a lot of the taste testing we've done of like this compared to dry aged beef and we've done this hand in hand with certified angus beef in their culinary center with their bovine anatomists like their phd butchers you know and um yeah a 48 hour steak with some mold growing on it pretty much takes like a 30 day dry aged steak wow some even argue, you know, it, it can get funky enough that it's pushing that 45 day envelope as, as far as like the yeasty notes and the cheesy profile that this mold can create on protein. So if you really want to go crazy, you can do that. Now, the other option is that can be really tricky. If you haven't grown koji on a lot of like rice or barley or been comfortable just growing it, you don't want to jump into meat and grow it on there. You're going to throw out a lot. You're going to waste a lot of meat until you're comfortable with this process. So the other thing you can do is get that dried koji we talked about earlier, that rice that's it's already been grown on and dried or the, the barley. You get that, you powder it up and you rub your steak with it. You leave it in your fridge for 48 hours, 36 hours. And then you take that steak, whether you want to scrape off the, the powdered uh, koji rice or barley that you put on there or leave it on and add more spices to it and then put it on the grill, you're going to be like, I can never eat beef without mm. koji again the rest of my life. Insane That's the profile? That's you're going to make. Two days, three days is going to be, or two days is going to be akin to a 30-day dry age? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and, you know, that's rough. And like, keep in mind, you know, we're not trying to say that this is a replacement for dry age or anything like it's a separate process that creates flavors in a, a fraction of the time that are very, very similar. So in its own right, it's its own thing and this great thing. But those of you that are like, man, I don't have a dry ager at home. You know, I don't have a cabinet or I don't have a setup for that. And it's really expensive stuff. Mm. Well, you know, you want to take, you, you want to buy a chuck and like butcher out the back end of the ribeye, you know, out of that chuck and have some really nice steaks for yourselves. And, you know, at that chuck price, rub it down with koji or maybe grow a little bit and, and not, not worry about it. You're, you're off to the races, man. You know, you're, you're, you're going to have a great experience. Maybe what we have to do is I'm going to buy a chunk of meat and throw it in your ager 
and we're going to take that time to get it to 100 days. And then as we are encroaching on the finish of that, we will then cut off some steaks, uh, not from that one, but from a different one, and then koji those up and try and meet as close as we can to a replicated 100, 100 days of koji and then the real 100 days of the dry age and have a blind taste test and see which one we like better. You bet. I'm, I'm all about it. We got to do it. You had it's going to be so much fun. Koji and helping make a sweet barbecue sauce without the use of actual sugars and stuff. How do we do that real quick? So, you know, the same way that Koji's enzymes work on protein, which is what we've been talking a lot about, it, it does the same thing with starch into sugar. So you can take tomatoes, you can add a little bit of this amazaki we've been talking about and slow simmer it while you're cooking, right? We talked about this temperature range that these enzymes can work in. So if you're simmering that sauce at 140 to 150 degrees with just tomatoes and a little bit of amazaki in it, you're never going to have to add sugar because the <laughs> Koji's enzymes will turn the starches in the flesh of the tomato into the sugars that they're made up out of. Kind of, it's like a key unlocking everything. So you can actually create like really flavorful food without having to add a bunch of extra stuff that you're like, you know, hey, most of us that tend to grill and barbecue, you know, the the, the healthfulness of things going into our body isn't always, you know, we're eating smoke processed meat. Like, let's be frank here, you yep. know? So being able to take kind of little steps, like cut back on the sugar a little bit or use the sugar that's inherent in the ingredients you're already using to create you know, sweet flavors, I think is really, really cool. Um, and literally, it's as simple as like taking that Amazaki or some active enzyme containing Koji product and low temp cooking your barbecue sauce as it going, you're never going to have to add any sugar. Maybe you're going to want to add a touch of honey to get the honey flavor or a little bit of molasses to get the molasses flavor, but you don't need it as a thickener, as a sweetener or anything like that because Koji can create that. And I think one last thing that's kind of really cool too is Koji can de-bitter things. Mm. So those of you that are kind of hitting roadblocks as to what do I do with all my burnt ends and this, I'm saving them, I got a bag of them in the freezer, this sort of thing. Literally, you talked about the testicles and the heart I fed you the other day, <laughs> you know, this miso made from these parts of the animal. Uh, your burnt ends, you can kind of put through a similar process. And Koji actually on a molecular level will break apart the bitter tasting compounds so they don't taste bitter. Did I feed you a lemonade the other day? Koji lemonade. Yeah, I had that a couple of weeks ago. It was insane. Yeah, literally, man, we take whole lemons and throw them in the blender with Koji. You'd think that'd be bitter as hell, like the peel, the pith, the seeds, everything, right. and it's not. So like Koji, if, if it sits with things for a little bit, can actually de-bitter them. So uh, you can take your burnt ends. You can run them through the meat grinder. You can add a percentage of koji, add a percentage of salt that's in line with the ratios for making miso. Let it sit for a few weeks, whether cold or room temperature, depending on how much salt you added to stabilize it. And it will literally de-bitter these things. And then you've got like a meat spread. You want to, I can't tell you, man, that like heart and testicle pace. Like we just did lamb ribs the other day. We finished them up today on the menu. What do you think they were rubbed with? Really? Yeah, the same thing I said to do with the pork ribs. I took like wow. a, a you know a few tablespoons of that that lamb testicle and and heart miso mixed, thinned it with a little water. That was on the ribs overnight, and wow. then the next morning you got crusted and put in the smoker. Man, did you make so the hollow bread too? These really cool things you can. Yeah, like you could turn your burnt ends back into the marinade <laughs> that you're then going to make more burnt ends with. Like, it's like you sour mash these, of like, whiskey, right? Yeah, like sour mash or think of like ramen culture in Japan. Like there's some ramen restaurants that have had the same pot boiling for like 200 years and every day they serve everything but like a quart of that and then they refill it and build it up and they just, they keep the spirit of the batch going right. or, you know, the sausage makers that backslop or charcuterie makers or any, you know, anybody that keeps these cultures going. Like it's really cool and, and, you know, like I said, you can turn your burnt ends into the seasoning and flavoring that you're then going to rub on a brisket and make more, more burnt ends or a tri-tip or whatever you're doing, you know? So it's really cool. We make this, uh, you know, as we're getting ready to wrap up, Greg, we make this product called Jewish penicillin. So we take, um, when we make the chicken stock, all the little bones and shredded bits of meat and the mirepoix, we grind that, we mix it with koji and a bunch of salt, and then we let it sit for like a year. And this stuff is like the most intense chicken bouillon ever. Bro, we just take it and we rub it all over all the chicken we cook in the restaurant. Hmm. We're literally taking like 
chicken that we preserved into a spice and a seasoning now and rubbing it on the chicken that we're going to be cooking. And like, you wow. can do these really cool things, you know, Koji is so much fun. I don't know what else to say. You've said it all. You're blowing everybody's mind here, especially mine. And you're local to me. I mean, it's a blessing that I was introduced to you by a guy I have coming up in the second hour, Daniel Vaughn from Texas monthly, who said, Hey, have you ever been to Larder, this was a number of years ago, and we literally left oh. Mabel's Barbecue and shot right down to the store and uh, was introduced to you and, and all the wonderful things that you were doing. I've been a big fan ever since, as you know, so uh, this has been a... Well, thanks, Greg, and Dan, yeah. Dan's awesome, man. I Oh, man, he better come back to visit soon. I need well, to feed him. Hopefully, he will come back, and when he does, I will be in tow, no doubt about it, and uh, we'll catch up then. Anyway... This is Jeremy Yamansky. You find him larderdb.com by his book, Koji Alchemy, that he co-wrote as well. Can you uh, please enlighten me on the co-author uh, name, please, so we give him just due? Oh, yeah. Richard She is my co-author. Rich is based out of Boston. And, you know, anybody out there that's looking to get into Koji, whether you reach out to me, and I'm always slow to respond, especially the online platforms, uh, but Rich is hyper-responsive. Um, you, you can find him at Our Cook Quest. And he loves some good barbecue with Koji. Jeremy, really appreciate the time tonight, and we will talk to you again soon. All right, Greg. Have a great evening. I look forward to feeding you soon. All right. Take care, pal. That's Jeremy Umansky. And when I say we'll be talking again soon, that means, like, tomorrow. <laughs> time for Chicken Sando. <laughs> All right. So... As Meathead generated buzz about Koji back in January, hopefully we have been able to answer a multitude of questions. Maybe you were thinking about getting into this. Maybe you have now been inspired to get into this. Now you know where to go. The book is a good place to start. The reference material of our day and our time on Koji, Koji Alchemy, which can be found wherever books are sold if you read books. We are over into the second hour, so I'm going to do an abridged closeout, and then it will also be an abridged second top. And then we'll get to Wes Ride and Daniel Vaughn in the second hour, so we will wrap the first hour right after this. Stick around. Be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content. In an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Craig Rampey. And we thank Jeremy Mansky for joining us for the last two segments plus. Larder DB, like Delta Bravo. LarderDB.com, the restaurant website. Koji Alchemy is the book. Buzzed BBQ Company. Okay, what the F is Koji actually? It's a spore that you grow on rice, and when you grow a, was it a gram or four grams of it, it makes 400 pounds worth of Koji. Or you can buy the bottled stuff and get it that way. The Shio Koji, and then there's also Amazake. Amazake. So go to Amazon or go to your... Asian markets and hook up with some of that. There's some great Asian markets right here in Bomb City, USA on the east side that I could pick up at or I just might go to Amazon. I think I'm going to start getting into this and we are definitely doing the real 100 day dry age and the Koji dry age towards 100 days and have a blind taste test. So check back in 100 days from now, which was going to be like July. Maybe we'll shoot for a July 10th taste test because that's my birthday. Yay, yay. All right, we are pointed to the second hour, which we will have a four-minute top, and then we will catch the clock up and be right back. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show right here on the Barbecue Central Network. <laughs> 